Hi everybody, and welcome back to the channel. For a very long time without fatigue, does this statement really reflect exercise performed at critical power or not? I would argue not, and what I'd like to do in this presentation is give you my take on the real physiology underpinning critical power and the critical power concept. This all goes back to the original work of Mono and Scherer in 1965, and last week I showed you this particular figure as it shows the forced time uh, curves that they generated for both static and uh, intermittent exercise. And you can see the static exercise here in A, intermittent exercise in B. And what they argued was the, the asymptote, or what they called erroneously the critical power, was the maximum rate that a muscle can keep up for a very long time without fatigue, the emphasis being mine. But what does a very long time mean and what does without fatigue mean? That's what I'd like to try and address today. They also asserted that at and below the critical power, exhaustion cannot occur. And we automatically think, well, that doesn't really sound right because you can be exhausted at quite low exercise intensity for all kinds of reasons. So maybe they have erred here. But if you look at the literature, there are other statements that are related to this and follow straight on from it. So, for example, endurance at critical power is infinitely long and the time to exhaustion is indefinite at the critical power. And this has led to quite a lot of, if you like, hard inference on this basis. In other words, critics of the critical power concept will tell you that if any of these statements don't hold then the critical power model is a rubbish model. So if you see a non-infinite uh, endurance time at critical power, then the critical power model is wrong. I don't actually think this is true. I think this is a misreading or misrepresentation of the model itself. So let's start with for a very long time. What does that actually mean? Well, what we know is that the hyperbolic relationship that the critical power concept describes describes the time to exhaustion exclusively in the severe intensity domain and it describes it as a function of the utilization of w prime in relation to the power requirements of the task relative to critical power in other words you can either use up the w prime quite rapidly by choosing a high initial power output and ending up with a relatively short time to exhaustion, or you can use it up relatively slowly, eke it out, and therefore exercise for longer. But you will always sit along this curve. This curve is shaped towards an asymptote, but of course, mathematically, that curve never actually reaches it. Um, and if you think about if it does reach it, then this simply becomes P minus CP. If P is equal to CP, then this becomes zero. And as any mathematician will tell you, dividing something by zero is a folly. What this actually means is this model predicts its own downfall. It tells you where it doesn't apply, and that actually makes it a strong model. I would argue that the weakest models in science are the ones that purport to explain absolutely everything, but predict absolutely nothing. And I'm mentioning no names there. <coughs> Tim Noakes central governor model. We now need to think about the physiology of this. So we know that when we perform exercise below and above the critical power, so here we have 15 watts below the critical power, measured by a three-minute all-out test, and 15 watts above it, we see steady-state responses below the critical power, but non-steady-state responses above the critical power. Now, the interesting thing is this. If you remember back a few weeks, I told you that the VO2 response was driven by high energy phosphate metabolism. So the breakdown of phosphocreatine, the rise of creatine and inorganic phosphate, the mitochondria, is driving the VO2 response. So you should expect to see a mirror, mirror image response below and above the critical power in phosphocreatine. Now, the only real way of doing this with uh, enough data points to, to see a similar curve shape is to use magnetic resonance spectroscopy to do it. And that's what Andy Jones and his colleagues did in 2008. So here is the rig they used. 
you can see there's a superconducting magnet. And because 31p phosphorus is the uh, most abundant, in fact, the only uh, phosphorus metabolite that, or phosphorus um, isotope, I should say, which uh, is stable in nature. And so all of the phosphorus in your body is going to be 31p. And so what you can do is you can stick somebody in a, in a magnet and those metabolites containing phosphate will resonate in that magnetic field. And then you just uh, use various bits of equipment to pick up the signal. So I've completely and utterly murdered magnetic resonance spectroscopy, but you get pretty pictures that look like this. So here you see these are data from Wilson and colleagues in 1988. And you see, and if memory serves me correctly, this is for forearm exercise, but you get the same uh, spectra, whether you, you measure the forearm or the quadriceps or what have you. Andy Jones was measuring the quadriceps for Morris muscle. And you can see there's a very large peak for phosphocreatine. And you see that here. You see a very small one for inorganic phosphate. This is at rest, of course. And then you see the three peaks for ATP. And then what Wilson and colleagues did was four minutes of maximal intensity exercise and you end up with these spectra at the end of that process. So here you see a whacking great peak for inorganic phosphate at the end of exercise, very small peak for phosphocreatine and slightly lower peaks for each of the ATP phosphates. You can also see that pH has dropped from 6.99, so about 7, down to almost 6. And you can maybe just about pick out that the Inorgan the inorganic phosphate peak has also shifted in that direction. In other words, you can calculate the change in pH from the shift in the inorganic phosphate peak. Nevertheless, what Andy Jones did was essentially get people in a magnet and exercise below and above the predetermined critical power to and doing knee extension exercise to try and find out what the metabolic responses would be under those conditions. And here's what he found. So this is the response in heavy exercise, so two watts below the critical power. And you can see that the uh, heavy exercise response, you get a, an initial depletion of phosphocreatine, and then you reach an approximate steady state. Whereas above the critical power, you see a very much greater decline in phosphocreatine. You can also see a slow component like drop in the uh, phosphocreatine response and the uh, end exercise values are very much lower than during heavy intensity exercise. They also, of course, measured inorganic phosphate, and this is even more impressive. So this is for heavy intensity exercise, so rapidly reaches a steady state, about double the resting concentration, or 250%, uh, so about two and a half times the resting concentration. But then for severe intensity exercise, a very, very large inorganic phosphate response of up to 900%, uh, so eight or nine times the resting level. Now, if you calculate what that would be in terms of uh, a concentration, you're seeing inorganic phosphate values of greater than 15 millimoles per liter there, which anyone will tell you if you try and pump that into a muscle, that's not going to do the muscle any favors whatsoever. So clearly there may be some uh, metabolite-mediated fatigue that occurs above the critical power that doesn't occur below it. And that got me interested, and this is where I kind of come into this story, because I wanted to determine whether critical torque in an isometric model was really a fatigue threshold. So we're now asking the question, does this occur without fatigue below critical power, or critical torque in this case, but with fatigue above critical torque? And the way we do that is with the classic Brenda Bigland Ritchie protocol, of uh, three second contraction, two seconds rest uh, at a target. This, in this particular case is 45% MVC. And then we throw in a maximal contraction every minute and we measure the fatigue response to that. And we do that at five different um, intensities above what we, where we think the crit critical torque is and then we did two below the critical torque. And each maximal contraction was associated with electrical stimulation during and after the contraction. Now I'm only going to focus on the data after the contraction because what we're doing here is a potentiated doublet we call it. So we do two very rapid stimulations and then measure the response to it. It's potentiated because it takes place after a maximal contraction and because that uh, stimulation is occurring without any voluntary muscle activity any change in that will indicate peripheral fatigue. So that's what we're going to measure. 
and here's what we found. So each of these bouts of exercise in this quadrant of the chart, these are the severe intensity responses to exhaustion or to task failure. So between about uh, 2 and 17 minutes in duration. And you can see a very rapid drop in the potentiated doublet, so clearly peripheral fatigue occurring, reaching approximately the same level irrespective of the time to task failure. So very similar situation in each case. In contrast, for the 90% critical torque and the 80% critical torque, which are the two bouts below critical torque that we did, the rate of fatigue was very much slower. So there was a decline in the potentiated doublet. So there is fatigue below critical torque, but it occurs about four to five times slower than above critical torque. So whilst there is fatigue, it's clearly different. Now, there's a gap here because one participant failed to complete the full duration of the 90 uh, percent critical torque trial but that individual interestingly had quite a large degree of central fatigue uh, in that particular case not peripheral fatigue nevertheless we can still see a very clear difference in the rate at which fatigue occurs and this is even clearer if you plot the rate of change in potentiated doublet and that's what you're seeing here and what's really nice about this is that the severe intensity responses all seem to sit along the same line so they scale with one another and if you back extrapolate that it predicts zero fatigue at about 34 percent mvc which is exactly where the critical torque was and in, even more interestingly it obviously predicts further that there would be uh, negative fatigue if you like below the critical torque that of course doesn't happen but even here you can see that these two data points are dropping below the zero line. So there is fatigue here, but it is disproportionately slower than the rate of fatigue above the critical torque. So critical torque is a fatigue threshold, but it's a fatigue threshold separating two different types of fatigue, not fatigueless and fatiguing tasks. Andy Jones took this on and uh, developed some uh, biopsy techniques at Exeter and started to look at this again in whole body exercise. So these are data from Matt Black's PhD thesis. And here you see the VO2 responses to severe, heavy and moderate intensity exercise lasting uh, well over three hours. And then you see the blood lactate responses. These are all the normal things you'd see. So no steady state above the critical power steady state just below it this heavy exercise bout was actually on the uh, the edge of the 95 percent confidence limit associated with critical power and then you have moderate exercise at 90 percent of the gas exchange threshold so uh, lactate remains at resting levels vo2 remains steady state you have a slow component that doesn't reach vo2 max in heavy exercise and the attainment of vo2 max following severe exercise so everything doing what it should be doing in those bouts and, and exercise intensity domains. Interestingly, the biopsy data showed that the phosphocreatine response to severe intensity exercise was as severe as you'd expect it to be. It was less severe in heavy exercise, so less phosphocreatine breakdown, which is consistent with what we saw in our fatigue work, and relatively limited breakdown following uh, very prolonged moderate intensity exercise. And then you look at the glycogen responses, there is some glycogen depletion following severe intensity exercise simply because of the uh, requirements for carbohydrate metabolism at those intensities. More but not significantly more glycogen breakdown in the upper reaches of the heavy intensity domain. And you've got to remember that is in the, the upper reaches of the heavy domain. And then severe glycogen depletion following uh, two hours, or sorry, following three hours of uh, very heavy Oh, sorry, not very heavy, uh, moderate intensity exercise. But this is interesting because it, it's not entirely clear what's causing task failure in heavy exercise. And it's probably a combination of factors, possibly including glycogen depletion. Because remember I said a few weeks ago that you don't need to completely deplete your glycogen stores for glycogen to have an influence on muscle function. And it may be that the uh, triadic uh, glycogen stores uh, the intramyofibrillar glycogen is also being depleted in this case. Around the same time, there were questions about what was really determining the critical power. And I show you here two excellent studies, one from Annie Van Hattelow, again down in Exeter, 
and one from Emma Mitchell in Loughborough working with Richard Ferguson, so shout out to you guys. Um, and what they both showed independently was that there was a correlation between the critical power and the proportion of type 1 fibres in the participants in their study. So here's Annie's data, uh, the critical power measured using a three-minute all-out test versus the type 1 fibre percentage. You see a significant correlation there. And then Emma Mitchell's work showed a stronger correlation with slightly fitter participants between fibre type and critical power. What they also showed was there was no correlation between type 1 fibre percentage and the W prime, which is you know, perhaps rather obvious that W prime is not uh, related to oxidative potential. But what I find really interesting about these data is that when the capillary contacts around uh, type 1 fibres were calculated and then correlated with critical power, the correlation was even stronger than simply using type 1 fibre percentage on its own. So when you add both the, if you like, the oxidative machinery of the muscle, the type 1 fibres, and their supporting structures together in terms of the capillary contacts around those type 1 fibres, you get an even stronger correlation. So there really is no doubt that critical power is an aerobic uh, endurance parameter. So where does this leave us all? Well, first of all, critical power does not predict an infinite time to failure at itself. It doesn't actually, actually predict anything at itself, and that's kind of the point. Exercise at or below critical power is not fatigueless, it's just a different type of fatigue. And above the critical power, we think that high energy phosphate metabolite mediated peripheral fatigue is probably the major player in the fatigue process. We are a lot less sure about the fatigue mechanisms below the critical power, and it appears to be a complex interplay of factors, including glycogen depletion amongst many other things. And finally, critical power is probably determined by both the metabolic machinery of the exercising muscle and its supporting structures as well. And I hope you found that as fascinating as I did, because critical power really is a fascinating beast to study and apply. Thank you very much for your attention. If you liked my content, please don't forget to like this video and subscribe, and I'll catch you next time. Thank you very much.